Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome back to the Form Book Club. We are still discussing this wonderful book, Chance of the Dance by Thomas Howard. And wonderful as it is, we're going to finish it in this session, no matter how long it takes. Uh, and it shouldn't take too long, although he has some very good material at the end here. And we actually stopped in the middle of sex. That's very bad. It's like discussio interrupta. <laughs> And <laughs> Father, that's an example of Bordy. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost a perfect <laughs> intro to the topic. Yes. Uh, so we're going to talk about Bordy, B-A-W-D-Y. It'll be Joseph and Vivian's Theology of the Body. Uh, <laughs> but so let's let's jump let's jump right into the chapter. I well, I, I'm actually very pleased, Father, that you began with a practical example of it, an incarnational dimension of Bordy, because it made us all laugh. And I think it's meant to. And it reminds me, actually, of Chesterton's wonderful essay on running after one's hat. You know, why do we laugh at the sight of someone running after their own hat? It's because we uh, accept and respect the dignity of the human person. When we see a human person doing something which is absurd, right, it actually turns everything upside down and, and we, we can't help laughing. And I think that it's the same sort of route to boardiness, right, is that sex is quite rightly uh, held up there as, as something which is uh, worthy of reverence. And indeed, Thomas Howard's very good at talk, discussing that aspect of it too, which he does later in the chapter. But also, when it's not actually treated with reverence. Um, it, it can be because of the lack of dignity to something which inherently has dignity, the human person and the communion between human people, um, it can just become hilariously funny. And so one thing I did want to point out, I, I, I don't particularly have passages uh, uh, highlighted, perhaps Vivian does, and I'll, and I'll defer to Vivian in a moment, but you know, on page 100 and on page 99, he asked the question, but what about Bordy then? And then what about Chaucer and Shakespeare in their more robust moments? To say nothing of Restoration Drama and Fanny Hill and Don Juan and Swinburne and then most of 20th century literature. Um, it, it, so in other words, that if we're holding sex up at a pedestal, how do we deal with the, these works of literature which actually lampoon it on occasions? Vivian? Well, he also points out that um, the hierarchy that we give to human behavior is not a Gnostic or dualistic Manichaean, the body is evil and mind and spirit is good and they're in this, you know, battle. He, he's very quick to point out that is not the case uh, and that body is, is actually an example of our recognition that there is a hierarchy in behavior and that honor goes to some things and maybe not even mentioning goes to other things. And then he's he talks about appropriateness, which of course is a relative term, but is it, you know, he says um, that this appropriate, inappropriate, on page uh, 102, he says, it throws other issues into relief. If it is nothing at all but body, it still may be saved by its tone, that is by a certain levity that is fully aware of itself as precisely body and nothing more. If it loses that twinkle and becomes a leer, then it has failed and as worthless as pornography. It is absolutely excellent. And I love the fact he uses a couple of good examples here. Sir John Falstaff from Shakespeare and the wife of Bath from Chaucer. The key thing is these people are actually held up for ridicule. Um, you know, Sir John Falstaff, he's all about his appetites. He's gluttonous, not just with respect to sex, but with respect to food and respect to drink. He's a, he's a drunkard. 
Um, he's fat because he just eats too much. And yes, he has no control of his sexual appetite either. And this is something which is actually lampooned by Shakespeare. And then, of course, over the course of the the, 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 the three plays of um, Henry the Fourth, Part One and Part Two, and Henry the Fifth, and then he brings him back, of course, for the Merry Wives of Windsor. You know, in the course of all of this, he is shown to be someone who is not contemptible because he's now really just an object of ridicule. Um, and so I think that how do the great writers who are Christians, such as Shakespeare and Chaucer, deal with bawdy? And it's actually to show, look, that's what you really look like, you know, when you become a slave to your appetite. There's a, to me, a, a, a very famous passage. Well, famous to me, what does that mean? Uh, but a favorite passage of mine in C.S. Lewis's Miracles, where he says something like this, the whole of Christian anthropology can be derived from our laughing at body stories and our telling of ghost stories. The idea being that we recognize there's something wrong and horrible about the spirit apart from the body, so they, they should be together, but there's something incongruous about the fact that they are together with all the bathroom jokes and bedroom jokes. Anyway, it's a good, I recommend that book, by the way, to anybody, uh, anybody, period. It's one of the great books of the 20th century. And I'm really pleased, Father, to use that example because it's, it's perfect. I mean, ghosts are creepy because it's the spirit without the body. And boardiness is, is ridiculous and is lampooned because it's the body without the spirit. I mean, it's perfect. I mean, it's what actually Thomas Howard goes on to discuss later in the chapter in more elevated language. That's right. He talks about that all uh, sexual um, excess or missing the mark is actually this very problem of separating the body from the spirit and it's really a profound, it, it's worth reading the whole thing, but um, he sums it up on page 110, where he says, the executive with his call girl, the boy <laughs> with the trick, the queen with her hustler, all participate in the black mass, which divides form and substance, for it takes the form, the body, and discards the substance, the person, it takes the form, the right of two bodies, R-I-T-E, and discards the substance, the union of two persons. Yeah, which is perfect. I'd actually highlighted the same passage. And if you'll uh, permit me, Vivian, I want to go back. I mean, that's the climax to it. Right. I did, avoid, Joe, yeah, I'm, go ahead, Joseph. I'm that's what I did, too. References to, to, to boardiness here. Um, but that, that of the passage, that's towards the end of it. But um, And it really does. It can, it's the conclusion, and it's wonderful. And... Uh, but before it, the human body, this is just a few lines further up on page 110. The human body is the epiphany of personhood. Mm -hmm. It cloaks and reveals a human individual. A doctor may probe it strictly as a complex of organs and tissue. A gymnastics coach may manipulate it as a pattern of muscles. But the sexual exploration of this mass of tissue and muscles puts the bread and wine on the altar. The real presence of the person must now be reckoned with. The sale, and then, and then the, what, what you mentioned there. So, mm -hmm. again, I, this, he, this is Thomas Howard at his absolute best. Now, okay, in between the two that you quoted uh, is the one that I underlined, uh, which you both omitted. The sailor sweating over the strumpet's body it's like a priest rushing into the tabernacle and gobbling the bread for a snack. <laughs> well, Father, it was in deference to the honor of your office. <laughs> <laughs> but this is his whole point. His whole point with this whole book is to show that the reverence we show to the actions that we do, the rights, R-I-T-E-S-S, that we... Uh, create or discover, however you want to look at that, um, 
are all pointing that, that our actions mean something, right? That that's what the whole point of this book is. Our actions mean something, things mean something. And by the time he gets to the end of this chapter, I don't know if you're ready to go there yet. He shows that the difference between the sailor and the strumpet and the priest gobbling up the, <laughs> the uh, what do you call those things? The Host. Uh, Host. The, Yes, but but what's the category? The species or something? Um, that uh, we're missing something when we do these things. We're not participating in what these things really are when we uh, desecrate them or dishonor them or whatever. It's so connected. We do it's so honor these things and enter them, then something really amazing happens, which is on page 118, uh, those who honor the shrine move by their very attendance on the rubric towards some great and unimagined unveiling when the ecstatic secret is open to those who have learned that no churl will see the holy thing. Those who have learned that it is not by pushing into a thousand shrines that one becomes able to pass through that final veil, but rather by brave and single attendance on the one shrine committed to one, who knows that an unveiling is a real unveiling only to the extent that what is veiled is set apart from other things, that one's appreciation of the reward is in some ratio to what one has experienced of patience in waiting for it, to those who've received the ecstatic communion entrusted to them as an image of some final communion when the knowledge of all beings will be ecstatic. That yes, yeah. is just phenomenal. It is. Uh, and, you know, and, and the whole, I mean, the whole book, and obviously we get to discussion of sex, it's on a, on a different level, but the whole book really is about the dignity of the human person. And, and I think that's what's lost in the whole of modern life in our cynicism and our materialism, you know, but it's, it's in sex, if you take with the dignity of the human person, you do have, you know, the strump, the, uh, the sailor sweating over the strumpet, and you also have the uh, systemic infanticide. Because, you know, if you're going to insist that we can treat each other with contempt, which is really what multiple partners is doing, then we have to treat the offspring of those multiple partnerships with contempt. And there's no dignity to any human person from the unborn to the, to the eldest. The moment we, we forget the reverence of the, towards the dignity of the human person, which is really at its apex, if you like, in the sexual union. Right, but it, you're right that it's about the dignity of the human person, this book is, but specifically distinguishing between human beings seen merely scientifically as so many atoms and molecules in some kind of a, an arrangement on the one hand, and human beings are seen as an image as pointing to something beyond them, above and below, and part of this chain of being in the great dance. And that's, that's where the imagination is what's needed in order for us to discover and express the dignity of what otherwise will be seen as a mere chance agglomeration of material particles. I agree completely. Obviously, what I was saying there was not the fullness of, of the scope, the panorama that, that Thomas Howard presents here. But I did say dignity to the human person, not dignity to the human being. I mean, human being, ultimately, there's nothing wrong with the term, but, but it's used very, uh, in a, how should I put this, in a, in a very um, devalued way, in an in, 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 you know, inflationary currency way. The human being is something that a scientist might use. When you talk about the dignity of the human person, it's saying, okay, you not don't have dignity because you're part of a species, you know, you, you know, only, but right. because you're a person, right? Um, and I see, so I think, so I think that's uh, important. I, I did want to distinguish. I used the word human person, not human being, for for a reason. I would like to uh, go back and quote a couple of passages to kind of summarize or. You know, reader, what we've said, but on page 97 in the middle, he says, I know of no serious work of the human imagination which proceeds upon the idea that there's nothing but dalliance in sexuality. That's interesting that 
you know, unless we're going to reject our entire past as if there was only, you know, barbarians and uneducated and, and those who had not come of age, we have to say, is there something to this fact that all imaginative literature sees something deeper in the sexual relationship? Then on page... Uh, yeah, yes, but oh, I'm, I'm, pleased you, I'm pleased you selected that, Father, and just to comment briefly on it, you know, and, and and what you said about it is that we have, we're talking about the whole of human experience here as expressed in imaginative literature. And we can only have this experiment, this perverse experiment we have now um, with sexuality and, and, and who we are and aren't, if we say that everybody in the past is basically untermenschen, right? That, that they're, they're subhuman and not worth taking seriously. And if, what you can, one thing, easy way of doing that is to find all the language of the scapegoat. So you can so you can make them all the same, regardless. And a good word that's being used these days is racist. Right? The past is racist, therefore we can ignore the past. Except as we brought up last time, uh, that whatever race you want to look at, or tribe, or people, uh, maybe they don't have a body of imaginative literature to show us, but they have their taboos and they have their rites and they have their rituals that that also show that they understand that the sexual is something sacred. Well, the, the, the women communing with respected. each other, women communing with each other as regards the tribes that exist in our globalist culture, they're shrinking. Um, but uh, about the tribes that exist across the panorama of the millennia. And the point is that the, the, the modern neo-Marxist understanding of racism would be something that anybody prior to 100 years ago, 150 years ago, would be clueless about. They wouldn't even know what you were talking about. So we're accusing people of things that they have absolutely no concept of. You won't find any understanding of a, an ideological understanding of racism anywhere in Homer or Shakespeare. You might point a, a, a finger like you might point a finger at a Jew and say he's being racist because he's doing this. But he would not understand what you were talking about if you accused it to him personally. These are modern concepts. I want to go to page 109 at the bottom, and this again summarizes what you said. Four lines up there. The human body is available for any number of activities. Sports, medical inspection, work. But when it is taken into the service of the sexual right, or ITE, a universe of significance comes upon it like God into the mass. Interesting analogy here. And immediately the participants are less than the thing in which they are participating. And it is theirs to observe the rubric with awe. The equipment is no longer merely object, it is image. Taken into the right, it is transformed. Uh, but he kind of says, say, 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 he's, he said the, he's got the great ability to say the same thing differently, uh, which sort of, it's like walking around the statue of David per, perspectively. You kind of see the one thing, but you see it a little different angle, and it gives you more of a three dimension to it. Yeah. Well, good. Uh, is it, it, yeah, that's that. I mean, I, I just wanted to say that's absolutely beautiful, and it does show the sacramental dimension to the human sexual communion. You know, um, I would like to add because Father, you asked a question last time about whether or not this, you know, soaring spiritualized language with respect to the sexual act, yes, uh, you know, translates into day to day human experience. And um, I appreciated that he, um, on page 105, he says that um, he describes the sexual act as the energy that strains toward total union. And then if you drop down farther in that page, he says, there is ironically in this most soaring of all satisfactions, a radical sense of incompleteness. That, that's a really important thing to point out to couples that you're preparing for marriage. That uh, 
Here you're trying to give them this elevated view of marriage, this elevated view of the marital act, such that the church calls it a sacrament, a vehicle of grace, a vehicle of transformation in Christ. And then you want to at the same time, and this is where the body comes in handy, actually. There is this awkwardness about it. There is this almost buffoonery about it. There is this is that it? Is that all? Is there something missing? Am I missing something? Is, uh, uh, you know, that, that this is not heaven. And even though our ecstatic experiences of beauty, of love, of sex, of childbirth, of all these things are like this momentary, like, glimpse of something. There, this actually ties in very well, and it's not, no, no, no coincidence that it's in the same chapter with Thomas Howard's um, discussion of body, because one of the euphemisms for, should we say, the climactic moment in sexual union is to die, all right? So yes, it's come to an end, right? But it's not a satisfying end. And it's, you know, it's a bit like, you know, that, that you can have a meal and it'd be a really good meal and you're satisfied in one sense at the end of it. Insofar, insofar as you're a glutton, you're not satisfied for long, right? And what's true of food or drink is, is true is true of sex. Well, so in other words, it's not something which is going to be fully fulfilling. That's right. And that's why in the church, the sign of the celibate, the celibate priest, the consecrated virgin, is an eschatological sign, meaning that however good and wonderful this thing is to participate in, in the here and now. It's a sign of something to come. And those who give up that good for this other vocation are pointing us in this other direction, saying, look, this don't stop here and get too comfortable, everybody. Yeah, although it's, still, although it's still a, it's still an image, a symbol of marriage, all right? I mean, because it's still the bride and the bridegroom. So yes. uh, it's not escaping from that. Celibacy is not the absence of Marriage is choosing the absence of a lower marriage for a higher one. Right, but and and the, the 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 higher marriage, meaning the ultimate marriage, the ultimate consummation of all things in God, that all of these other things are signposts to lead us to. And so that's why you want to counsel the young bride. You know, you are participating in this wonderful, sacred, beautiful, life-giving thing. But on those moments when you're a little disappointed, <laughs> you know, don't let that discourage you because we're on a pilgrimage to another wedding, to another marriage feast, the marriage feast of the Lamb. And that's when all of this will be taken up into this ultimate final realization and satisfaction of all our desires. Well, and let's give the last word to Thomas Aquinas. And I don't know how he knows this, or how I believe that he's, he's correct. But he said in his lapidary way, post coitum tristitia, after the embrace, sadness, you know. Yes. Yeah. So, in, have we in, had enough sex in, for in, today? In, in, the, in yeah. this veil of tears, that's true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we move on from sex now? Well, right. Everyone needs to at some point, Father. Yeah. Um, well, well and, and it's so perfect that the next chapter, Bravo the Humdrum. Yes. I mean, he, he knows what he's doing. He's very right. clever about right. what he's doing. I mean, in, 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 the image of, uh, in the image of sort of 1940s cinema, this is the cigarette that they pan to, right? It's the yeah. Humdrum. <laughs> After so, the event, you can't who, show. Who, who would like to go first? Oh, I have nothing to 129, so if anyone's before that, they trump me. Well, before we get to 129, uh, what he does so brilliantly is somehow he shows that the hippie, uh, the, the reader of Esquire Playboy, uh, and the town and country set, you know, that's a magazine, I don't know if it's popular anymore, showing the way the other side lives, that all of these are a form of escapism. Well, from the humdrum of, of human existence. And, but what Howard is going to argue is that it's in the very everyday, ordinary things that we do 
that we find our path to glory. Okay. And, I, and I have three passages prior to 129 my, I want to re read. So I guess I get the prayer. Please, you're priority absolutely here. The, the floor is yours. Page 122, uh, but oh, third of the way up from the bottom. Uh, these are disparate images with which the contemporary imagination is hailed. And they have, oddly enough, the com that common idea that the humdrum is here and the real stuff over there. It's not in the hit Ashbury pad. He's writing, you know, in the 60s. Well, that's the hippie. So right. he's getting these images now. On the Aegean, you know. That's the town and country set and the Playboy Esquire set. And if, and if not there, the country club or book review circle, while the wash rinse cycle completes itself. <laughs> that's some drum. There is a quest that is for interest and significance somewhere other than in the humdrum. That's right. Yeah. The desire to escape it. That's what he's saying all these things are. And, 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 the, and Father has another piece, but just like a comment. And then the saddest thing about that, of course, is that they, they are unsatisfied in the moment and always looking for the, the moment that, for the most part, never comes. Now, I would like to add, you know, on page 123, um... Well, you know, Aristotle did say that the highest life is the life of contemplation. And that uh, this is why we have other people to do the work, you see. That, 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 so the slaves, yeah. Christianity resolved this, this conflict of, well, only the rich and the people who have slaves or servants can live this life of leisure and, and enjoy this contemplation, this philosophical life. Uh, how did the Christian reconcile this well with the feast, the festival, the religious uh, holiday? And this is what paper in Leisure, the Basis of Culture, is so brilliant at bringing out that if you rob a man of his religion, the person most robbed, actually, is the person down at the bottom, the person who now never gets a break from his toil, never has a holiday, never has a fair or a festival or a dance or a maypole or anything with which to make merry and enjoy the fruits of his labors. He's just a slave. And I don't, I don't, I, 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 you know, it, it wouldn't be traditional if we didn't have a little small argument. But, you know, but also with the Romans, you know, that uh, it's, it's about Panamit circuses. So you give the poor the NFL instead of a holiday. And, you know? and uh, Peeper, it's not satisfying and it's not as enjoyable. Well, but they, as they, they, because they don't appreciate out, the humdrum, they don't know that, you know. And as Peeper points out, Joseph, exactly that. Uh, what we, We've forgotten what real leisure is. Yes. Because the way we tend to spend our leisure time is on things like that, the NFL yep. or, and that's not really recreation, which is no. what, right? And so we, if we've replaced, look at how the secular calendar in America, every secular holiday has replaced where there was a religious one, you know? And, and as if that's, that's like substituting, you know, saltine crackers for real Italian bread, you know? <laughs> but there's another, there's people another... don't ever have saltine crackers. They know no different. That's the sad thing. Father, yes. we, we keep usurping your passages you're trying no, to all right. to. No, this is good, but I guess I want to follow on to what Vivian said there, that another way the Catholic Church was able to universalize in a certain sense the kind of elitism of Aristotle where you had to have slaves do your work so you could contemplate is that the archetype of contemplation, which is the eternal son of God contemplating the father, took flesh, and for 30 years, he did nothing worth noting. We do not know, except for his vision of the temple. So we don't know what he did, except that, well, he went to the bathroom, he went to the well. I mean, he helped sweep the house. He was a carpenter or a mason, whatever. But for 30 years... God himself, infinite wisdom and contemplation, did the dishes. So, I mean, I, I think the, the uh, validation of the humdrum is the incarnation. Yes. Uh, okay. Page 125, paragraph at the bottom. 
uh, this view, which is the his uh, old myth, would understand the sense of ennui and alienation that plagues our epoch to be the natural corollary to the disavowal of the eternal from which derives the validity of everything that appears in our experience. This, again, the eternal God coming to Nazareth. But would say that sooner or later, the human imagination, which is forever asking for significance, will find it frustrating to be told that it's not to ask the question of significance, since that is not a property of things. Things mm -hmm. merely analyzed into their parts do not have significance. Well, if this doesn't mean anything then, the imagination replies, there's this. No? Well, then looks over here. What about this? No? Well, here then. No again? Alas, the world is weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. This is, of course, the burden of the 20th century chorus. Uh -huh. It is in flat-out pursuit of something that will reassure, amuse, and stimulate it. The common stuff of life has nothing to be said for it except that it is necessary and boring. And hence, one must seek what one's imagination wants in the new, the varied, the bizarre, the remote, and the intense. Hence, the jet set. Hence, high fashion. Hence, hot and hallucinogens and random sex and happenings in the avant-garde syndrome. And I would say, and hence social media, tweeting, and texting. Not that it can never be done, but it's trying to fill one's life with something new. Oh, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Oh, well, I put on a red shirt. Oh, well, I just got off of the station. Who the hell cares? But, you know, they're trying to find something meaningful. Well, it would be meaningful if they simply were to participate in those activities in their in the and not feel like they have to turn them into a show for the consumption yeah, it's, it's, it's 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 uh narcissism but it's not about you know looking at a sunset or enjoying a bonfire either by yourself or with friends it's about looking at myself and hoping other people will think i'm as beautiful as i think i am all of which all of which is a lie because beneath the veneer everybody is full of self loathing <laughs> well, that's a happy thought. But you know, the, the perfect example of the modern technological advances creating leisure that people don't know what to do with, and now setting in with this ennui, is Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. That, that, that is exactly what that book is about. That women were liberated from the drudgery of housework with all of these new devices, and by the way, I'm as grateful as any woman for my washing machine. I'm glad I don't have to go down to the river and beat my clothes with rocks. That's where all the women used. To, that's where all the women used to hang out. That was their leisure time. You know, I know, but even, even 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 things like that, right? If everyone went down to the river at the same time to beat their wash at the same time, that's when they caught up with conversation. You can actually look forward to it because you're not actually thinking about the beating the washing. You're thinking about the communion that's happening by the river. Right. That's true. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. However, I do I do feel I do make good use of my leisure, like reading Thomas Howard. <laughs> but in any case, and talking with you folks, but in any case, uh, no, this is what the feminine mystique is all about, that these women were freed from this work. And guess what? They were bored. They found no meaning in their lives. So they had to go out in search of meaning by becoming lawyers and running for president of the United States. Uh, I agree with you both. I just want to call up an image of many years ago when I drove a little two-cylinder car from France to India. And driving into India, it was somewhere near uh, New Delhi going, going east. And we're out in the country. And we saw on the side of the road, there's a river there. And these uh, Indian women are by the river washing their saris, okay? And a sari is just like a great big long sheet that you, you whirl around, twirl around yourself. And so these women had washed their saris in the river and beat it with rocks or whatever. And they, <laughs> they, need some, they tied one end to a tree. And then the other end, 
they had wrapped around themselves one fold, you know, modestly, waiting for the wind to dry the rest of the sari. And they were talking to each other. And I have to say this. Uh, uh, I met a, a priest there, uh, a wonderful Jesuit priest, uh, Father Serac, down in Madras, formerly Madras, now it's called Kenai, Chenna, I think. Anyway, when he used to come back and give talks to people in France about the Indian people, he'd say, the one, if I had used one word to describe them, it would be joy. And I saw that. I drove all around India. People clinging on the buses with their roosters, and, you know, and, and dogs and stuff in the bus and so on. Uh, people crowding on the side of the road. We drove through on a road <laughs> and uh, we saw all this grain there. What's going on? Well, they were threshing the wheat. We were threshing the wheat for them by driving our car on the road where they'd spread out their wheat so we could thresh it for them. But there, there was happiness everywhere, even though there was tremendous poverty. Uh, Father, Father, I, I, I thought I knew quite a lot about your life. I never knew you went through a hippie phase where you had to go to, you know, beyond Marrakesh to the real McCoy in India. So when did this happen? It happened in 1969. And the reason it happened is I was teaching philosophy in 1967 in the University of Santa Clara. And this was during the hippie period. Yeah. And, and they would say, the students say, oh, that's just Western thinking. You know, that's logic. But they don't use the principle of non-contradiction in, in the East. You know, I said, that's ridiculous. It's a principle of the mind. But I kind of had to prove it to them in the future to myself. So you know, we bought this car. I, I modified it so we could take the back seat out and put a little bed in there, a little two-cylinder car, uh, to de chevaux. And we drove to India. So I come back and say, look, I was there. And they still, they use Aristotle's principle, non contradiction I can guarantee you, so I you, saw it myself. You were a hippie and basically the only Thomistic hippie by the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to go to page 127. I got two more citations here. And uh, you can jump in any time. The old myth would have seen the given, the humdrum in most cases, as on the other hand, precisely the agent and mediator of something substantial, of the way things are, in a word. This is not to say that everyone up to the Enlightenment went whistling about the kitchen and the farmyard, merry and content in the knowledge that his broomstick or shovel was a summum bonum highest good. It is simply to say that the old myth itself sanctioned the humdrum by seeing it, along with everything else in the world, as image. That is, the commonplaces of life, the given rhythms of experience in which every human being is involved, whether he's a king or serf, jet setter typist, things like birth, growth, learning, work, marriage, and friendship, are themselves the occasions in which we may enact what is real, what lies at the root of things. He's magnificent. Perfect. Perfect. I mean, beautifully written. And, I and as, he go ahead. as he points out, Father, that is what leads to joy. You you mentioned joy. Yes. Ah, in India. Well, that's where he's leading up to with this chapter. And where he ends the chapter, page 132, and ends the book, actually, the business of the poet and prophet has always been to take the saws, saw meaning, a, you know, a commonplace, and astonish and delight us into a fresh awareness of what they mean by discovering them suddenly in this image and in this and this. And the rest of us may see it all either as a pointless jumble of phenomena, that's chance, or as the diagram of glory, hyphen, space, uh, as grinding tediously toward entropy or as dancing toward the dance, capital E. That, we see life as either grinding tediously toward entropy, the scientific view, or as dancing toward the dance, the Catholic view. Nothing more to be said after that coup de grace. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, it is. Father, do you, want to, do you want to mention next week? Yes, we are finally going to uh, 
become more philosophical, although this is pretty philosophical too, with Father McTague's real philosophy for real people. I need to figure out how far to go, Joseph. Do you know, where should we well, go? I had a quick look on, on the assumption, Father, that we're going to spend three weeks and then a fourth week with Father McTague, God willing. Um, I thought that maybe it's a 300-page book, just about. Uh, if we were to read the first three chapters plus the, the front material for next week and then the two other sections after that. Does that sound reasonable? We no, may not get that far. No, we may not get that far. No, it course, doesn't but. sound reasonable, but we'll do it anyway. But I think 100 pages is probably too much for us to get through. But let's let's set that as our goal and we'll see how far we get. Okay, sounds good. Thank you and thank you. God bless Thomas Howard. Rest in peace. I hope he's hearing those words, well done, good and faithful servant. God bless you all. Amen. See you next week on the Formed Book Club. If you enjoyed this discussion, please help spread the word about the Formed Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.